now that we have gone through the basics of our antidepressants and our treatment for major depressive disorder, we'll focus in on some of the treatment options for the anxiety and related disorders. So it's important to realize that there's a fair amount of overlap. However, there are some, some notable differences. So I'm gonna move this a little bit so you can see better. So we have benzodiazepines come into play. Um, benzodiazepines have a very specific role in management of anxiety that we'll talk about. However, we use SSRIs and SNRIs and TCAs, my goodness, um, to help treat anxiety as well. The products that you're not gonna be as familiar with if you haven't seen, um, you know, haven't seen this stuff before are going to be buspirone or buspar, hydroxazine, propranolol, other products like pregabalin and gabapentin, and other types of antidepressants, antipsychotics that can sometimes be used to help out with anxieties. So considerations with our treatment, whoop, wrong direction, there we go, is for a lot of these conditions, individuals might experience a potential for an increase in anxiety symptoms, particularly generalized anxiety and panic. So in general, starting a lower dose, being a bit more cautious about dosing titration in individuals who have generalized anxiety disorders helpful. They oftentimes need to end up at higher doses, particularly with OCD, to get the benefit. So they're tougher to treat with antidepressants, frankly. Therapy sessions are appropriate. So therapy is incredibly beneficial for most types of anxiety. So really trying to advocate for someone if they have the resources, if they have the motivation to engage in therapy. So to start off with, we'll talk about benzodiazepines. And benzodiazepines are a very versatile type of product, but they are certainly not without their own challenges. So they are centrally acting sedatives. They help people sleep. They're also anxiolytics, so they help people feel less anxious. They have anticonvulsant effects, so they can stop seizures. Um, they also have muscle relaxing effects. So if someone has a, you know, a spinal cord injury and they have spasticity, this can help. And they have various indications. Not every product has the same indications, but they can be indicated for anxiety disorders, sleep, seizure management, managing alcohol withdrawal, relieving muscle spasms, lots of different reasons why someone might be prescribed a benzodiazepine. So our benzodiazepines function on this beautiful little receptor here called the gamma aminobutyric acid or GABA receptor. So GABA receptors are um, traditionally uh, inhibitory neurotransmitters, right? So GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It has a negative chloride ion that, tr uh, that goes from the extracellular space into the intracellular space to activate it. And What's important to kind of take into consideration with these products is they aren't GABA analogs. So we actually do have some products that look like GABA a bit more than our benzodiazepines. They actually work at a different site. So as you can see, let me pull up my little pointer thing, my little pen. So as you can see here, right? So, oh my God, it's being so goofy. I, it's a little bird now, I don't know. but. We have our benzodiazepines that that interact with this subunit of the GABA receptor, not the GABA site itself, which is up here. Okay. So what happens then is the frequency with which the channel opens increases. So we have an increase in frequency of opening of that channel to allow chloride to go from extracellular to intercellular to activate. Now we have other older products like barbiturates that used to be used a fair amount to help with things like anxiety. And those actually increased the duration of the channel staying open, um, but they're associated with more toxicity. So we don't really use them much anymore. So benzos, frequency. Benzos are your frenzos, is how I remember it. Benzos are your frenzos. Barbiturates have the er sound duration. One way to remember if you need to, right? So um, you'll also see we have zilpidem, which are non-benzodiazepine receptor agonists, um, or Z drugs, which are more helpful for um, hypnosis and sleep. And then flumazenil, which is actually a uh, reversal agent for benzodiazepines. So in words, binds to GABA, 
at the GABA receptor at the alpha and gamma subunit, and it increases affinity for GABA, causing a shift of chloride ions intracellularly um, by increasing that channel opening, so increasing the frequency. So we do see sedation and hypnosis, anxiolysis, and muscle relaxation. Now, people will become tolerant to this the sedation and hypnosis and the anticonvulsant effects with uh, repeated dosing. That's why a lot of times um, when used for a long period of time to help with sleep, the benefit starts to decline. So the utility of benzodiazepines is really interesting because the dose really dictates the effect, right? So uh, one way to think about it is the general sedation continuum. So when we first give a low dose of a benzodiazepine, people start to feel a little calmer or a little, you know, a little chiller, you know, their vibe starts to kind of come down. Slightly higher doses, they fall asleep. You keep going and we get what's called anesthesia. Now, it doesn't necessarily cause you to feel less pain in the, um, the true sense, but it certainly makes you care a whole lot less about it. And you're pretty much asleep. It doesn't bother you kind of thing, right? But you can still feel pain technically. It's not going to fully cause, uh, you know, pain to go away. And a lot of times we'll use this in combination with other products that can help with pain for, for certain types of procedures. And then of course, if you give even more, then people will experience a coma and it can cause death, right? So the big sparkly bit down here is death. Now we obviously don't want that. We're really sticking up near the top um, between sedation and hypnosis essentially when we're thinking about how to use it as an anxiolytic. So our products that are listed here are some of the ones that you're going to see more often, right? So as epoxide was used a lot more for alcohol withdrawal. Historically, we don't use it quite as much anymore. Clonazepam or clonopin, clorazepate or tranxine, again, not one you see super often anymore. Diazepam or Valium. We have alprazolam or Xanax, lorazepam or Ativan, temazepam or Restoril, triazolam or Halcyon, oxazepam or Cerax. The ones you're probably going to run into most often, clonazepam, diazepam, alprazolam, lorazepam. Those are the ones that are really the most widespread used products. And they do differ in terms of their how long they last in the system, um, how they are broken down. So sometimes we'll use different products for people who um, have liver dysfunction, things like that. But for the sake of this brief overview, those are all the products. <laughs> so concerns with benzodiazepines. They are a scheduled substance. They can cause dependence. They can cause um, significant, significant withdrawal if someone has been taking them for a long period of time. Now, from a side effects perspective, it's the stuff that you would expect as a CNS depressant, right? So sedation and at high, high doses, respiratory depression. We also see impairment kind of similar to alcohol. So there is some uh, overlap in terms of the pharmacologic activity of benzodiazepines and alcohol. So that can increase falls, particularly in the elderly. Um, and actually in, in youth, there are some increases in uh, injury associated with benzodiazepines use. Confusion aggression and disinhibition. So there can be what's kind of called a paradoxical reaction where, you know, you know, if someone goes out and has a couple glasses of wine, they go, woo, and they get like really activated or they um, paradoxical reactions to Benadryl or antihistamines, same kind of idea in that someone might um, actually just get disinhibited by a benzodiazepine and have kind of the, not the, not the result that we were potentially looking for. So if someone's never had a benzodiazepine before and say they're going to get on a plane and they were going to take a medication to help with anxiety, honestly, trying it out beforehand in a safe space, not with the intention of anything beyond making sure that you're not someone who gets disinhibited is not an unreasonable thing to consider. We also see amnesia. So um, kind of losing time either antero and or retrograde, so before or after the time with which the individual took the medication, which can get tricky with things like therapy, um, particularly if it's a trauma-related therapy, and of course that dependence and abuse. <laughs> All right, so that risk for disordered use, abuse, and dependence. If someone has a history of substance use, such as alcohol use disorder, that risk is going to be increased. 
if we minimize our treatment duration and really use this for crisis level anxiety or very specific phobias, really important. Trying to get a good medical history, monitoring for potential for diversion. So we have like prescription drug monitoring programs that allow us to keep track of the medications that people are using that have these risks associated with them. And some people can take these types of medications for a long period of time and do really well and um, have little to no issues. There have been associations with um, risk of cognitive decline that's hard to really uh, pare down as the, what the true risk there is. There are risks for things like falls. And as individuals get older, they may have um, more accumulation of the products because their metabolism changes. So people, you know, by and large, we try not to let people be on these products for decades. But there are exceptions to that. There are people that can really, really benefit from being on benzodiazepines for a super long time. A lot of times it's with things like panic disorder. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just making sure that that is reserved for the right kind of, of situation. Because uh, I like to think of benzodiazepines as a... Um, think about you you fall into the ocean and you still need you need to get to shore right you fall off a boat and you're in the ocean you need to get to shore benzodiazepines are kind of like if someone throws you like the life preserver right the little like life preserver so you're floating in the ocean your head's above water but you still have to get to shore right these will keep your head above water but you still need something else to get to shore. And that's that could be therapy, that could be um, antidepressants, it could be a lot of different things. This will help with the symptoms of anxiety, but don't do a great job of treating the underlying issue, okay? And then if someone takes these medications for more than four to six weeks, especially consistently, then we run into risk of withdrawal. We talked about antidepressant withdrawal. They can be quite unpleasant. This, similar to alcohol withdrawal, actually can be uh, dangerous, all right? Um, because of its effects on the seizure threshold, we can see in rare cases, and I've seen it personally, seizures, delirium, catatonia, psychosis, these kind of rebound effects that can cause pretty significant detriment to the individual. In most cases, what we're going to see is these rebound type effects. And the challenge with that is they will kind of look like the things that they were trying to treat as well, right? So if someone was taking um, a benzodiazepine for sleep for several, several years, and they stop taking it, they can experience significant insomnia. And the insomnia might not be something that lasts. It might not be something that it's like, oh, see, it was treating the insomnia, where it could actually be withdrawal from the benzodiazepine is just causing difficulty sleeping. And given a timeline or thoughtful tapering, that insomnia will go away. But we do see changes in irritability, anxiety, we see some, some physiological changes similar to alcohol withdrawal of things like high heart rates, of tachycardia, et cetera. And then we can see uh, kind of a, almost like a, a significant depressive state following a withdrawal from benzodiazepines, nausea, confusion, changes in vision. So certainly things that we want to be really careful with. And how to avoid it is if someone's been on benzodiazepines for a really long time, then having a really slow taper. And that can sometimes mean six months or more. And that's okay. That is okay. We would much rather try to get someone to, you know, get to a low dose or come off of a benzodiazepine in the safest way possible. And that might mean it's a really long journey. And that's okay. All right. On the other side of things, of course, is the risk of overdose. Unlike some other products, it is not super, super, super dangerous, but can be if taken in high enough doses, right? And what we'll see is CNS depression, respiratory depression, and difficulty breathing, et cetera. Oftentimes, this can happen in situations where other products are involved. So someone was taking opioids and benzodiazepines, or they have something else going on, like they have um, chronic uh, COPD, like difficulty breathing or heart issues. So they're already at risk of the effects of benzodiazepines. But it can happen alone as well, just not as common. 
we don't use the flumazenil the, or the reversal agent very often because of the risks of precipitating withdrawal because you can have seizures and stuff. So in a lot of cases, unless absolutely necessary, we don't use the reversal agent super often. So place, we kind of talked a little bit about it, but acute use should be really where we start. So rapid relief, someone's starting antidepressants and they are having difficulty adjusting because of that short-term increase in anxiety that can happen as that change in neurotransmitter availability can take a while for the body to adjust to and moving up to a maximum six weeks and then taper, right? And this is not for everyone. It's really when there's crisis level anxiety, when someone is incredibly anxious and it is on this high, high severe scale, right? Um, we want to use other things like uh, taking advantage of the mammalian dive reflex by you know, putting your face in, in cold water, breathing techniques, grounding techniques. Those types of things should be taught actually, even if you are using benzodiazepines to help with anxiety, but using this without trying to teach those other skills is not a great choice either. If someone's severe, refractory, particularly um, panic disorder tends to be the group that uh, is going to be more likely to, um, you know, need high, high duration of benzodiazepines. But in most cases, we kind of want to try to avoid using these long term unless, unless we've exhausted other options or that super severe situation. <laughs> 